Intermolecular Forces, Part 1. A bond between two different atoms, such as C and O, is polar. If you look at the general example of X double bonded to Y, you see that Y is more electronegative than X, which puts a partial negative charge on Y. Electrons spend more time around Y than X, and that gives X a partial positive charge. In the specific case of formaldehyde, H2C double bond O, if you look just at C double bond O, you can see that there is an arrow written above that bond, and that arrow is the bond dipole mu. The arrow head points toward a partially negative oxygen atom, which would be Y, and the plus end of the arrow is centered over the partially positive carbon atom, which would be X. This bond dipole has both direction, where the arrow is pointing, and size, or magnitude, that's the length of the arrow, which depends on how much the charge is being separated. And that depends on the difference in the electronegativity of the two atoms. Bond dipoles in a molecule will add up. If the bond dipoles are pointing in opposite direction, and they're of the same size, then the bond dipoles will cancel out in the molecule, such as in the case of CO2. You see the O double bond C dipole is pointing in opposite directions, which means that they will cancel out, giving a dipole moment of zero, mu equals zero, and that makes the molecule nonpolar. When the bond dipoles don't cancel out, that is, the dipole moment is greater than zero, we have a polar molecule. So in the case of formaldehyde shown at the bottom, you have one dipole on C double bond O pointing straight across from left to right, and then we have two small dipoles coming from the CH bonds, and they're both pointing toward the C. None of these dipoles are canceling out, and you can kind of think about this as uh, the effect of winds coming together, the dipoles are like little winds, and if you imagine the winds coming from these various directions, there would be a net wind which would push a sail in the direction of CO, okay? Because none of the dipoles are actually pointing in equal and opposite directions, so we get a net thrust, a net dipole moment in one direction. That makes the molecule polar. Whoa, our slide color changed. Well, that's okay. We needed to understand how we're going to use these molecular dipoles. Whether the bond dipoles cancel out, that is, whether or not the molecular dipole is zero or non-zero, will determine the types of attractive forces between molecules. These are the intermolecular forces. When the bond dipoles all cancel out, that is, the molecular dipole moment is zero, then all you have are weak London forces, which are those instantaneous attractive forces that you get between molecules caused by electrons sloshing around to get an instantaneous partial positive and partial negative charge, but no real permanent dipole interactions. These are very weak attractive forces. This is what you see in the case of CO2. Mu is zero, it's nonpolar, and the molecules just flip around and interact with each other very weakly through London forces, these instantaneous dipoles that form and break. With polar molecules, you have both London and the stronger dipole-dipole forces. Everybody gets London forces. If you have electron pairs, you have London forces. But you only get dipole-dipole forces if your molecule has a net dipole. So looking at formaldehyde again, we see that we can have these two formaldehyde molecules interact with each other because there is a net dipole. The attraction is between the partially negative red oxygen and the partially positive blue carbon. And so that will bring the molecules close together. And they'll actually tend to want to align the O and the C um, weakly uh, because of the dipole-dipole interaction. 
which is about ten times stronger than a London force. CH bonds mostly cancel their bond dipoles in carbon chains, making the carbon chain nonpolar, because of the zigzag arrangement of the carbon-carbon framework. If you look at butane, the CH bonds are going to be pointing in equal and opposite directions, causing the bond dipoles to cancel out. Butane is an example of a hydrocarbon, which are compounds with only C's and H's. And all hydrocarbons are nonpolar, possessing only London forces. With hydrocarbons, if you increase the carbon chain length, or simply add more atoms, then you're going to increase the number of electron pairs, which directly increases the amount of London force, and that's going to elevate the boiling point. So if you look at the examples at the bottom, on the left, we have pentane. Its boiling point is 36 degrees Celsius. If you add another CH2 group, now you have hexane with a boiling point of 69 degrees Celsius. Adding the extra carbon and two hydrogens adds more atoms, which means more electron pairs and more London force, causing the molecules of hexane to be stickier toward each other. So that increases their boiling point. It takes more energy to make them fly apart from a liquid to a gas. Okay, our last point about hydrocarbons is that given that you have isomers, so hydrocarbons with the same molecular formula, the one with the higher surface area will have the higher boiling point. If you look at two C5H12 isomers, the straight chain isomer, pentane, has a boiling point of 36 degrees Celsius, whereas its more compact isomer, 2,2-dimethylpropane has a boiling point of only 10 degrees Celsius. You can think about it as pentane is uh, like you're stretching out a snake, okay, which has a higher surface area than 2,2-dimethylpropane because that's more like a sphere. So it's, all, it's like it's all rolled up into a ball. So since pentane has a higher surface area, it has more interaction with other molecules of pentane, thus has greater London forces, and will have a higher boiling point, as compared to the second isomer, which is less surface contact, and therefore a lower boiling point. If you're comparing the boiling points of different compounds that are not hydrocarbons, for the isomers, the more polar isomer will always have the higher boiling point as in the case of cis-1,2-dichloroethene, which has a boiling point of 60.3 degrees Celsius, and its dipoles do not cancel out, versus trans-1,2-dichloroethene, where the dipoles are equal and opposite, canceling out, giving it a mu of zero. That's a nonpolar molecule. It only has London forces, and thus it has a lower boiling point. For isomers with the same dipole moment, all that matters is the surface area, and that increased surface area will increase the boiling point. For example, if you look at isomer A, with its boiling point of 151 degrees Celsius, it's stretched out, has a very large surface area, compared to isomer B, with a boiling point of only 106 degrees Celsius. It took the uh, carbon chain, and I squished it together into a branched carbon fragment, which allowed it to have a much smaller surface area, and thus a lower boiling point. If you're comparing the boiling point of compounds that are not isomers, you can't easily predict which one will have the higher boiling point. For example, compare tetrahydrofuran versus tetrahydrothiophene. In the case of tetrahydrofuran, the boiling point of 66 degrees, you have a much larger dipole moment. But in the case of tetrahydrothiophene, even though the dipole moment is smaller, there must be additional London forces through the extra electron pairs on sulfur to compensate for the smaller dipole moment, such that tetrahydrothiophene almost has doubled the boiling point of tetrahydrofuran. 
Now, you couldn't have predicted this. It's like comparing an apple to an orange. I don't know which is better. It's kind of subjective. Now, if you want to compare different molecules, it's best to compare the ones with the same dipole, and then the one with larger London forces will have a higher boiling point. For example, tetrahydropyran versus tetrahydropyran. Tetrahydropyran and tetrahydropyran have the same dipole moment. They have the same CO bonds pointing in the correct direction. But with tetrahydropyran, we have an additional CH2 group, which gives it more London forces. Thus, as we would predict, tetrahydropyran would have a higher boiling point, and it does, 88 degrees Celsius versus 66 for tetrahydropyran. This would be an apple-to-apple -apple comparison. Tetrahydropyran is the smaller apple, the smaller surface area. Tetrahydropyran would be the largest apple, the larger surface area, thus having a larger London force and higher boiling point. If you compare two molecules and one has both the greater dipole moment and greater London forces, that's easy because that must have the higher boiling point. In the case of tetrahydrothiophene versus tetrahydrothiophene one oxide, the additional SO bond not only adds extra pairs of electrons, so extra London forces, it also adds an SO dipole so that you have both increased London forces and increased dipole-dipole forces. That means that tetrahydrothiophene one oxide has to have a much larger boiling point than tetrahydrothiophene, and it does. At this point, we can't easily determine that a dipole-dipole force is going to be stronger than a bunch of London forces, but we now have a new attractive force, the hydrogen bond, which is going to be stronger than any of them. It's going to be stronger than most dipole-dipole forces and London forces. If you look at the structure of a hydrogen bond, it's an attraction between a proton, as an example of OH, with a dotted line, that's the hydrogen bond, to X. H is partially positive, X is partially negative or fully negative. X can be N, O, F attached to H, or an anion. An anion is fully negative. The strongest of these hydrogen bonds is to the anion. NH can also hydrogen bond to X, as can FH. In terms of relative hydrogen bond strength, FH hydrogen bonds are stronger than OH hydrogen bonds, which are much stronger than most dipole-dipole forces and the NH hydrogen bonds. In fact, NH hydrogen bonds are pretty weak. Um, you know that they're stronger than London forces, but beyond that, you really can't tell. Since a hydrogen bond made by OH is reliably stronger than a single dipole-dipole force or London force, replacing one atom or the terminal CH3 in a molecule with an OH group will automatically lead to a molecule with a higher boiling point, such as methyl iodide, the boiling point of 42.4 degrees Celsius, being converted into methanol with a boiling point of 65 degrees Celsius. We replace the iodine atom with an OH group, which can now, which can now hydrogen bond to itself, forming much tighter intramolecular forces and a higher boiling point. But remember, just one atom, or CH3, is replaced by the OH. If you do more, you cut out more material from the structure and then, and then replace it with an OH, that's not going to work. For example, if you take CH3CH2I, iodoethane, and compare that to methanol, CH3OH, you cut away the I and the CH2 and replace it with an OH. That's too many atoms. Now look, the boiling point of iodoethane is 72 degrees Celsius, and that of methanol is only 65 degrees Celsius. You have to replace only one atom or a CH3 with OH to, predict to predictably get a molecule with a higher boiling point. 
isomers in which one isomer has an OH and the other one doesn't are also easy to compare. The isomer with the OH will have a higher boiling point than the one without the OH. So here's an example of where hydrogen bonding beats dipole-dipole attractive forces. And here's an example of an isomer without an OH, diethyl ether, which has a dipole from the two CO bonds that are not canceling each other out, and a boiling point of 34.6 degrees Celsius, versus the isomer with an OH group, 1-butanol, with an enormously higher boiling point of 117.6 degrees Celsius. So that the hydrogen bonds between the OH groups in 1-butanol are much stronger than the dipole-dipole forces that are found in diethyl ether, causing 1-butanol to have an enormously higher boiling point. Here's a little picture of the attractive forces between 1-butanol molecules that lead this molecule to have such a high boiling point. You can see the dotted lines represent hydrogen bonds between the proton and OH and the oxygen of another butanol molecule. And each of these hydrogen bonds causes these molecules to be sticky to each other, and that means that more energy is going to be required to pull the liquid molecules apart, turning them into a gas. That's why 1-butanol has such a high boiling point. Whereas intermolecular hydrogen bonding, hydrogen bonding between molecules, leads to a high boiling point, intramolecular hydrogen bonding, where you have an OH or NH hydrogen bonding to another atom inside the same molecule, making a five or six-membered six hydrogen bonded ring, will lower the boiling point. So if you look at um, isomer X, it has a boiling point of 166 degrees Celsius, and there is an intramolecular hydrogen bond. The OH group is hydrogen bonding its partially positive proton to the partially negative oxygen in C double bond O, and that's a six-membered ring. In isomer Y, we don't have that opportunity for intramolecular hydrogen bonding, making our five- or six-membered ring. We only have intermolecular hydrogen bonding between molecules of Y. So the boiling point is higher at 206 degrees Celsius. Once you uh, put an intramolecular hydrogen bond in a molecule, that hydrogen bond doesn't want to be given to another molecule, increasing the stickiness. Therefore, the molecule is not as sticky to other molecules, meaning its boiling point is lower. Practice problem one. Arrange each set of compounds from lowest left to highest right boiling point and explain. Now remember you have to consider both attractive forces and surface area. The higher the surface area, the higher the boiling point. The higher the attractive forces, the higher the boiling point. And remember that intramolecular hydrogen bonding lowers boiling points. Intermolecular hydrogen bonding raises boiling points. Answers to practice problem one. In part A, compound one has a smaller surface area than the isomer two. Thus, compound one has a smaller boiling point. Compound two comes next, and then we have compound three, which has additional carbons and hydrogens, which gives it both a larger surface area and greater London forces. Thus, compound three has the highest boiling point. In part B, isomer three has a lower boiling point than isomer one, because isomer three has its bond dipoles canceling out. The bond dipoles for the CCL bonds are pointing in equal and opposite directions. Thus, there are only London forces for compound 3, giving it the lowest boiling point. Compound 1 has a net dipole. They're reinforcing dipoles, both pointing up. Thus, it has both London forces and dipole-dipole attraction, giving it a higher boiling point. Compound 2 has both the dipole-dipole and London forces of compound 1, but in addition, it has a little extra London force from the CH3 group at the bottom of the molecule. Thus, compound 2 has the highest boiling point. In part C, compound 2 is the smallest molecule. It has the fewest electron pairs. Therefore, it has the lowest boiling point. Compound 3 has additional electron pairs from the bromine atom. 
It also has dipole-dipole uh, forces from the CBR bond, so it has a higher boiling point. But then it, replacing Br with OH gives you the dramatic effect of hydrogen bonding, thus make compound 1 the substance with the highest boiling point. In part D, compound 3 has the same amount of London force as compound 1 because a CH3 group has the same number of electron pairs as an OH group. Compound 3 also has a dipole-dipole force due to C double bond O. But compound 1 has a higher boiling point than compound 3 because it has the additional dipole-dipole forces caused by the CO bond as well as the OH bond. Compound 2 has an even higher boiling point than compound 1 because compound 2 has intermolecular hydrogen bonding versus the intramolecular hydrogen bonding found in compound 1. If you look at the brackets at the bottom, the intermolecular hydrogen bonding in compound 2 makes it very sticky to other molecules of itself, thus requiring much more energy, higher temperature, to cause the liquid to convert into a gas. Let's examine the effect of intermolecular forces and intramolecular hydrogen bonding on melting point. If you look at isomers A and B, isomer A has a much higher melting point than B because it's able to have intermolecular hydrogen bonding, whereas isomer B does not have an OH group, so the best it can do is London forces and dipole-dipole interactions. Intramolecular hydrogen bonding decreases melting point, as we can see with isomers X and Y. Isomer X has an intramolecular hydrogen bond between OH and the oxygen doubly bonded to carbon, giving it a very low melting point compared to isomer Y, which has intermolecular hydrogen bonding. When you're considering the melting point of isomers, the one with the smallest surface area will have the higher melting point. If you look at the examples A and B, the more compact isomer A has a much higher melting point than B. Why is this the case that smaller surface area leads to higher melting point when it would always lead to lower boiling point? Well, it has to do with compactness, the ability of these molecules to be tightly fixed inside a crystal lattice. It takes more energy to get them out of the crystal lattice the less space there is for them to move around in. That's why compactness leads to higher melting point as you're trying to transform the substance from a solid to a liquid. You're trying to break out of the crystal lattice. The tighter you are inside that crystal lattice, the harder it is for you to get out. The more energy it takes for you to do so, thus the higher the melting point. Practice problem two. Arrange each set of compounds from lowest left to highest right melting point and explain. Remember to consider the compactness of the molecules, which would raise the melting point, as well as the attractive forces. Greater attractive forces mean higher melting point. Intramolecular hydrogen bonding lowers the melting point, whereas intermolecular hydrogen bonding raises the melting point. Answers to practice problem two. In part A, the lowest melting compound will be the least compact, which is compound 2. It has no hydrogen bonding because it has a Cl. Compound 1 is more compact because all the methyl groups are now arranged around the central carbon, so it's more like a sphere, and it still only has a Cl, so again, no hydrogen bonding. Then we get to compound 3, the highest melting compound, where OH is replacing Cl, so there's intermolecular hydrogen bonding there. It has the same compactness as number one. Therefore, it has greater attractive forces, greatest compactness, highest melting point. In part B, the lowest melting compound is three because of intramolecular hydrogen bonding. You can see the OH is able to form a six-sided hydrogen bonded ring with the oxygen and C double bond O. This prevents much of an attractive force between these types of molecules and only allows London and dipole-dipole interactions. 
compound one has a much higher melting point because it has intermolecular hydrogen bonding. It's a dramatic effect because now we have increased the melting point by over 100 degrees Celsius. Compound two is higher melting than compound one simply because of the additional methyl group which adds a little bit more London force.